So a number of years ago, we, we did this basins at risk study where we really tried to understand what the, uh, what the dynamics of conflict and cooperation were. And a lot of the things that we assumed would lead to conflict, scarcity, uh, economic growth, these kinds of things, didn't necessarily. And when we really looked carefully and closely, what we found is there's a relationship between change in a basin and the institutional capacity to absorb that change within a basin. So uh, the change could be hydrologic. You've got floods, you've got droughts, you've got uh, agricultural production growing, whatever it is, all these things are happening, or institutions also change. So, so uh, countries uh, kind of disintegrate, or there are new nations along basins and so on. These are the kinds of, of um, changes that we find, and that happens almost uh, independently. And then whether there's going to be conflict or not depends in a large part to what kind of institutions there are to help mitigate for the impacts of that change. So if you have a drought or, or um, economic uh, boom within a basin, if you have two friendly countries with a long history of treaties and, and of working together, uh, the likelihood of that spiraling into conflict is fairly low. On the other hand, the same droughts or the same uh, economic growth between two countries that don't have treaties or, or that there's hostility or, or um, uh, concern about the motives of the other, that then could lead to uh, to uh, settings that are, that are more conflictive. So understanding that, if we start to think about variability within, hydrologic variability within a basin as the kind of thing that changes, uh, the, one of the questions we can ask now is how well are the treaties around the world or the river basin organizations, how well adapted are they within that basin to deal with the ver natural variability of the hydrology? This is an interesting question in and of itself, and we're only now at a place where we can we have the data at the scale to answer that kind of question. So we went through in our database, uh, added hundreds of new treaties, and really looked through them very, very carefully to what they actually do and don't cover, and then pulled out those components that address variability specifically. Are there allocations? Are there conflict resolution mechanisms? Is there some recognition that basins aren't static? Uh, and encoded those for the entire world. And then uh, with the help of uh, Ken Sturzbeck at University of Colorado, then we're able to code the basins to their variability. So now we know how variable basins are around the world. We, we know how well treaties can deal with variability. You put them together and you have some areas of, of some concern. You may want to look a little more closely to see what's happening uh, as people try to mitigate these impacts. This now leads us to climate change, because we know that one of the, the um, overwhelming impacts of climate change is that the world's going to get more variable. Highs are going to be higher, lows are going to be lower. And so where we see these places with poor institutional capacity, uh, we start to get concerned if the models are also telling us that variability in those basins are going to increase. For example, all the rivers that come out of the Himalayan basins, there's a billion and a half people that rely on the waters that, uh, that re originate in the, in the Himalayas. And we know that, that, uh, that climate change is impacting the relationship between snow and, and water in that area. Uh, we've seen uh, tremendous flooding, for example, that we haven't seen historically, and uh, potential droughts as well. This is the kind of area where we, where we look to see increased variability within these basins. And then a lot of the Himalayan basins, uh, the Salween, for example, uh, area, parts of the Indus don't have any treaty coverage at all to deal with that variability.